We are now observing a lunar eclipse, and this gives me an idea. Why don't we launch a mission to the moon? Now, on March 27th, 1958, the newly formed uh, ARPA, also known as Advanced Project Research Agency, announced Operation Mona. This was Operation to the moon. The mission was really simple. Take a satellite, launch it to space, and take a few pictures of the moon and return some data from the moon, if you could, by flying uh, very close to it. Now, the mission was simple, but to achieve it was not as simple, unfortunately, because a lot of the rockets the United States had in 1958 and 1959 were not very successful. The Vanguard mission only had one success. Uh, the Juno rockets were Although successful with Explorer missions, were not very successful after that. And the Thor missions, which were, uh, or missiles, which were just newly released ICBMs uh, that were basically pointing toward the Soviet Union, were also not very successful. It was time for the US to rework its missiles and to start a completely new program. This was the beginning of Pioneer program, and it was meant for the moon. Welcome to What the Math. Today we're going to be talking about the Pioneer 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is episode 7 of History of Space Flight, and today we're talking about the Pioneer mission. Now, you can see that I've named this Pioneer 4 because this was actually the one that succeeded after all, the one that made it to the moon. But let's not spoil this yet. So, new rocket was Juno 2. This was a design that was a little bit different from the original Juno 1 because now we had a very, very large liquid stage on the bottom. This is here, or this is the right here. This was called Jupiter, and this would then go on to become one of the more popular uh, liquid stages uh, in, in NASA. Now, Jupiter was essentially a very, very large tank with four engines on the bottom. Uh, and uh, once it's finished its burning, the, uh, what the rocket would then do, it would then separate. And here's actually a picture that kind of shows you what this looks like. It, this would separate. And this is my separate tron right there. And then this upper part would start flying and uh, engage the solid boosters. Now, this part right here, th this this uh, little this little region, is, this is all telemetry. This is basically how the rocket would talk to the ground, how it would uh, send signals and so on, and how it was doing. So there's a lot of different electrical elements here. Uh, but once this stage separated, you would in inside of this, you would have the following. So I'm going to remove the fairing just to show you what it looks like. So here we go. This is a very little piece of rocketry, but it was actually very powerful. So uh, here, and I tried to recreate this as accurately as possible, we had um, something called a Sargent rocket. This was actually based on a um, uh, surface-to-surface missile called Sargent. Now, uh, all of these are basically Sargent boosters, and the Sargent missile was meant for delivering things like high explosives or even um, bacterial weapons or uh, nuclear weapons. Now, Sargent missile was very powerful, but we, we needed a lot of them to, to propel this upper stage. So, on the bottom we had 11, and this is what I have here, there's 11 Sargents on the bottom. Then there was another stage with only three Sargents, and on the last way, another one with only one Sargent. By the time that this uh, booster would stop uh, firing, this upper stage, which was essentially the satellite itself, I'm going to just separate to show you, this upper stage would actually be spinning really fast. It's something like 400 uh, rotations per minute. To slow it down, this particular stage had, uh, and this was kind of hard to recreate, and I decided to kind of skip this part, but... So it would have these two weights that would extend like this, and... Uh, because there was now weight on the outside part of the craft, the spin would actually slow down. So even though it was spinning really fast, it would then slow down to about six rotations per minute because this is something we call conservation of momentum. Now this is, think of a, uh, your physics class or even think of a, an ice skater that starts spinning with their arms uh, close together and then as they extend their arms, they start spinning less and less fast. So this is what this craft would do, but unfortunately, I couldn't really re recreate that, so I decided not to even add these to this design. But basically, so this is what it was. It was a kind of a cone-shaped probe. It was about 50 centi 58 centimeters high. It was about 25 centimeters in diameter. And it was made of fiberglass because uh, this was meant to maintain a very constant temperature on the inside, anywhere between 10 and 50 degrees Celsius. 
Um, at the end, when after the mission, they found out the temperature was actually about 43 degrees. And so this was a kind of a nice finding. But anyway, so why was it striped like this? Well, because it used something called photoelectric uh, sensors. The mission was really, really, really tricky. When this probe would approach the moon, if it was within 30,000 kilometers, it would receive enough light reflected from the moon that the sensors would trigger the camera inside of this and it would then start taking pictures of the moon. So this was kind of what this was meant for. It was meant to trigger the sensors that would start taking pictures and return those pictures to Earth. And so today we're going to try to recreate it. Unfortunately, since we don't really have a camera in this game or a photoelectric sensors, we're going to have to try to imitate that somehow and pretend that it just happened. Anyway, so we're going to launch this rocket and uh, try to reach the moon. And let's get ready for launch. So it is lunar eclipse or lunar eclipse in this case, and we're going to be launching our rocket from the Kerbal Space Center. So this mission was Pioneer 3 and Pioneer 4. Pioneer 3 unfortunately did not make it to the escape velocity and it fell back to Earth uh, after something like 30 hours in space. And it did manage to measure the Van Allen radiation belts and gave us a lot of really cool information about that, but its original mission, taking a picture of the moon, was unfortunately not a success. Now both of these were the same sort of satellites, they were cone-shaped, and uh, they had exactly the same sensors and exactly the same materials on the inside. So it, it was overall a pretty interesting mission. Uh, the sensor, like I said before, was designed to react with the uh, reflection of the sun from the moon. So once in the actual probe was within 30,000 kilometers of the moon, it would then start taking pictures of it. Unfortunately, Pioneer 4 never really made it that close. Uh, the closest it got to the moon was about 60,000 kilometers, so the actual camera never triggered. Uh, the uh, fight, uh, flight plan for Pioneer 3 uh, and Pioneer 4 uh, was designed so that after about 33, 34 hours, it would then escape into the solar orbit and would basically start orbiting the sun. Uh, but because of the depletion of the propellant in Pioneer 3 probe, it basically just never made it and returned back to, uh, to Earth and landed somewhere close to Africa. And basically, not landed, but crashed landed. And you can actually even find it somewhere in the location of 16.4 north, 18.6 east. And that's where it crashed. Um, but it, it did, did return telemetry and a lot of readings for about 25 hours. Uh, and so for those 25 hours, we got some really cool scientific knowledge from Pioneer 3. But the other 13 hours were actually a blackout period uh, for, for this mission because of the location where the rockets were, or the actual satellites were, because of the uh, because of the rotation of Earth and because it's really difficult to detect satellites from everywhere on the planet, uh, only certain locations were available for the uh, to receive those readings. Unfortunately, there were times when, because of the rotation of the Earth, uh, the U.S. was not able to actually receive any signals from, from the satellites. And so the Pioneer 4 was really the only mission that did succeed using Juno 2 rockets. And it was essentially very similar in design. So you had the same rocket, same, uh, exactly the same materials on the inside. It had the uh, stabilizer to stabilize it from spinning too much. And of course, the camera to take pictures. Uh, it passed within 60,000 kilometers of the moon's surface. Uh, but unfortunately, this was not enough light to trigger the sensors, and so the pictures were never taken. And uh, the first mission to actually take pictures of the moon were, uh, uh, was the Soviet mission. So Americans once again failed in trying to win this race, and the first pictures were from the Soviet Union. Uh, now, as of 1969, uh, the spacecraft was actually still detected in orbit, so... Uh, we actually saw it uh, again in 1969, so it's still orbiting the sun even today. And if you have a powerful enough telescope or some sort of detection system, you could still detect it. But because its batteries are long dead, you're not going to be able to do much with it. Uh, now, after a successful launch, um, this particular uh, probe actually did return uh, both radiation data and all, all kinds of other scientific data back to us for many, many hours. So it was a very, very successful mission in that sense. It just never really returned the pictures which we wanted to, to see. Now, we were able to track this probe, Pioneer 4 probe, for about 82 hours in total. And uh, up to a point that it reached a distance of about 650,000 kilometers from Earth. Now, that's about twice the distance from the Moon. 
And because the probe is so tiny, um, it's actually quite surprising that we were able to track it for so long. But once it uh, passed that point, it kind of got lost to us. And uh, because the battery were, were the batteries were going to be depleted within a few days after the launch, um, it's kind of going to be quite impossible to ever see it again, probably. Now, one thing I didn't mention is the actual dates of the launches. So, for Pioneer 3, this mission was launched in, in, on um, December 6, 1958. So, this was actually just a little bit before the Soviets were able to take the photo of the moon. And then Pioneer 4 was launched after that, after the Soviet success. And it was launched on uh, March 3rd, 1959. And by that date, Juno 2 had only managed to orbit two satellites, uh, and in other words, it was not a very successful rocket. So um, a lot of the uh, earlier designs were not very successful, and NASA actually had a lot of failures in, compar in comparison to the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, they decided to actually purchase four more Juno 2 rockets, and they did use them, and two of those were successful and two actually failed. So uh, NASA unfortunately had to redesign everything from scratch yet again. But this so-called first moon race uh, ended when the Soviets hit the moon with Luna 2 in September of 1959, a mission we'll be talking about in the future video. And they also photographed the far side of the moon with the Luna 3 mission. Uh, so basically they beat the United States yet again and uh, were quite successful in getting both the pictures and the data from the moon. And so unfortunately, out of uh, 23 launches that the United St States had in 1958, only six were successful, and these six missions were the Explorer 1, Explorer 3, and Explorer 4 missions, also the Vanguard mission, and all of these we've talked about in, in the previous videos, and SCORE mission that I've talked about in the previous video, and also Pioneer 3. So only, uh, and, uh, and Pioneer 3 was only marginally successful, not even that fully successful because it never reached the moon. So only uh, these missions were successful and uh, missions with uh, the pilot mission, which I talked about in the previous video, and uh, anything with the Thor rocket actually was a complete failure, including the Vanguard missions as well, except for, of course, Vanguard 1. But nevertheless, after the Juno 2 rocket uh, marginal success, uh, and also after the realization that they needed better um, quality control, in 1959 especially, they started to have more success. And they also realized that the Jupiter rocket that Juno 2 used as the bottom stage, as the liquid stage, was very, very successful, and they started to redesign their rockets in a similar manner. So the next year, in 1959, US was about to have a lot more success with both Juno 2 and even Thor rockets, and it was about to possibly even uh, catch up with Soviet Union in their successes on the moon and in space. And as Pioneer 4 reached the escape velocity from Earth and passed by the moon, it flew into its own uh, helicentric or sun orbit, where it basically is still today. It's orbiting the sun and it's basically acquired its own orbit. It was a really interesting mission and it was quite successful, but not obviously fully successful because having a first moon picture would be pretty awesome. But that was yet to come from the Soviets and from future uh, NASA missions as well. Anyway, so this is Pioneer missions in a nutshell. There were more to come and there were more successes in the future. We're going to talk about all of those in the future videos, so subscribe and like this video if you enjoyed it as well. Thank you guys for watching, and check out some of the other Kerbal Space Program or History of Space Program uh, videos that I posted right here. Thank you, game you later, and bye-bye.